Hi everyone, I'm Jess and I am the content manager here at Course Report. Course Report is the resource for helping people find the right coding boot camps for them. You can use the Course Report website to research the best coding boot camps all over the world, as well as insights on which coding languages to learn, where to apply, and how to fund your own coding boot camp experience. Today, I'm speaking with John Haynes, a UX UI webinar instructor at Thinkful about prototyping. John Haynes is currently a UX designer in Brooklyn, New York, and has a background in web development and journalism. So John, thank you so much for speaking with me today. I would love to kick off this portion with how you got into UX design and why you teach specifically at Thinkful. Sure, yeah, thank you for having me. Um, so I'm actually a former Thinkful student. Oh. Uh, I was working in tech back in 2017 and I noticed that there were a lot of people around me that had a lot more skills than I had um, in terms of uh, you know, technical skills, things like that. Um, so I wanted to look around for different types of courses that I could learn web development from, coding, things like that. Um, so I looked around and I found Thinkful's course. And at the moment, Thinkful was, uh, they weren't offering a UX course. I didn't even know what UX was at the time. Um, but basically um, I found the course and I was uh, attracted to it because of the one-on-one -on -one mentorship and the fact that it was online and remote. Um, so I decided to give it a shot and eventually I got a job as a JavaScript developer. Um, then, you know, uh, as luck would have it, I became part of a small startup team and uh, being the front end developer. And because I was part of such a small team, I was able to sit in meetings with stakeholders and customers and things like that and ask them questions about what kinds of, what kinds of features that they'd want on their, uh, on their products. Um, so all of a sudden I was doing user research and I didn't even know what it was. Um, so all, then all of a sudden the light bulb clicked and I knew that I basically just wanted to get into UX and do more of UX, um, something that I didn't even know was a thing uh, just a few years earlier. And while I was a student at Thinkful, um, I spent a lot of time networking. Uh, you know, I, I would uh, try to talk to as many people as possible just to kind of, um, you know, establish good relationships professionally, but also personally. And um, as luck would have it, you know, a year later, Thinkful contacted me and said, hey, would you like to teach with us? Um, and I thought that was great. Uh, I was basically transitioning into UX at the time, too. And they were uh, starting their UX course. So I figured that it would be a good time to kind of um, get on their team and create some content for them and uh, host some webinars as well. That's so cool. I love hearing um, the ties that you have to Thinkful. Um, so let's dive into prototyping and let's start at the very beginning. What exactly is prototyping? Sure. Um, so if the, the easiest way to think of a prototype is to imagine a house. Um, if you were to, you know, use the analogy of a house, um, the people that are actually building the house are developers. Those are the people that write code. Um, you know, they work with JavaScript, Python, things like that. Um, however, before that house is made, you need someone to make a blueprint, like some sort of architect. And that's basically what a prototype is. It's basically a, uh, a visual representation sometimes, usually, of uh, a sketch of how something's going to look when it eventually is being finished. And, um, you know, you have uh, more simple prototypes, which would be something like a wireframe. Um, and uh, the more high fidelity prototypes, uh, prototypes, which are basically able to, you know, have very simple clicking and dr uh, dragging functionality, things like that. And if we're looking at the design thinking process, when would you start prototyping? Um, so considering the design thinking process, uh, usually how it works, uh, well, I guess there's a, lot of there's a lot of interpretations of how design thinking works, but usually they follow a similar path. Um, it always starts with some sort of research, and then um, during the research process, the design team or whoever is involved is basically figuring out what problem needs to be solved. Once the team knows what problem there is to be solved, um, then it's, it enters into an ideation stage. And that's when the prototyping starts, where you know, people start taking out their notebooks and, and drawing uh, some simple sketches of what something is going to look like. And eventually it gets to a point where you know, I'm able to open up uh, Figma or Sketch or Adobe XD or one of these other tools and basically turn it into something that uh, that would make sense to a potential customer. And in general, what is the prototyping process? Like what are the main factors of it? First, you want to figure out what the objective of a prototype is. 
Um, so, you know, from the design thinking process, we know that there is a problem to be solved. Um, so the prototype has to solve this particular objective. Um, then you also want to kind of figure out a particular scope that the prototype is going to uh, cover. Um, it can't be, you know, too simple, but then again, it can't be too complex. It has to fit inside of a, um, a proposed scope, let's say. Um, so you have to figure out what the functionality of the prototype is. Um, then the next phase is, is basically to create the prototype and then to evaluate it and see, you know, what needs to be fixed or, you know, what doesn't work, what does work and how to test to see how to make it better. And what do prototypes actually help a designer or even a developer understand? I think the best thing that a UX designer or a UX design team can really do is to get everybody on the same page. Um, because when you are making something like a prototype, it's a, like I said, like it's a visual representation of what needs to be made. Um, so what it really does for not just the design team, but then also, let's say the product owner, let's say the development team, let's say the sales team, like whatever team wants to be involved in the particular prototype stage, it gets everyone on the same page so that everyone knows what is coming from the prototype. Um, the development team also does this when they create their, uh, you know, their first version or second version, but that also takes a lot of time. Um, something that's really powerful about prototyping is that it's so fast. Um, you know, I'm able to just go into one of these tools and make something very quickly and, you know, show it to someone and say, you know, is this what you're looking for or am I getting it completely wrong, basically? So it sounds like to me, any good designer knows that prototyping involves more than just the design team. You should be expecting to like work with many other <laughs> shareholders on this project. Yeah, for sure. I, I think that like, I, I think a lot of companies are, are starting to realize this and starting to realize that uh, there is a real value to UX in general. Um, I think that the upfront cost of doing UX early on definitely scares some people, some startups away. Um, but at the same time, it's like, you know, research has shown that the ROIs of someone that actually, like some company that actually does the due, due, the due diligence of, uh, you know, investing in UX, actually the like ROI just goes up exponentially. Um, and, you know, getting everyone from different, uh, different departments invested in, in UX is important, too. So we've covered sort of the high level look at prototyping, but right underneath that, it goes down into low fidelity and high fidelity prototypes. So I'd love to know what are the difference between those two? Sure. So uh, low fidelity uh, prototypes are basically what you'd find in a, no in a notebook. Um, like, for example, if I take a pen and paper and I just, you know, scribble something on a piece of paper or a napkin or something like that, um, it's going to be rough. It's going to be black and white, probably. Um, it's going to look probably pretty ugly. Um, but it's basically the quickest way to get my idea from my head to a piece of paper. Um, a high fidelity prototype is a little bit different. Um, it, there still is simplicity involved in it, but at the same time, you want it to look a little bit more similar um, to the end product. Um, so a high fidelity prototype might actually resemble what a development team is going to make. It's just that it won't have the same, uh, like the, that same level of functionality. So would you say like at this, at this point, even though it's 2020, um, designers should have a good handle on both low fidelity, just like the pen and paper stuff and high fidelity prototypes? Yeah, I mean, like, I guess it, it depends on... Um, what kind of designer you want to be because there are designers that you know they they only stick to let's say research and that's perfectly fine and then there are designers on the other end that only stick to you know complicated visual design sort of things um then you know in the middle it, it would make sense for everyone to kind of understand uh what low fidelity is versus high fidelity and the value of each and um you know i, I think you know being a designer also means that you should be try to be you know uh creative and try to uh test yourself and, and try to make new things and things like that. So I think that, you know, trying to do something low fidelity and, and high fidelity is, is, is a good uh, test of your abilities for sure. So it sounds like the original prototypes are probably done on a pen and paper basis. Um, but these days, as you've mentioned, there are a few different tools that are used for prototypes. Um, so I'd love to know what are your like top three prototyping tools that you're seeing designers rely on every day? Yeah, sure. There's, there's so many. Um, I think, you know, if you go back 10 years ago or so, um, uh, Sketch was one of the first ones to kind of be introduced as, um, you know, the tool for UX design since the, the, uh, um, the term UX designer was still very new at that time. 
Um, before that, people were making prototypes with um, Adobe Photoshop, for example. And you know, to use Adobe Photoshop for a prototype is basically like you know cutting a piece of bread with a chainsaw. Like it doesn't like you can do it, but it's just uh, it's a little bit too much because uh, Photoshop is is basically just too complex. Um, so that's why Sketch was invented and um, and you know created. And uh, for a long time, that was kind of like the only tool on the market. Um, but now you have um, just so many new tools. Um, three of the ones that I really like, I, I do like Sketch, but um, I won't be talking about it today. Um, it is Mac only, um, and I do use a Mac, but um, I definitely have three other ones that I definitely want to talk about. And the first would be Figma, which is basically uh, probably like the biggest tool on the market right now. A, a lot of companies are adapting to Figma because it's, it's, you're able to basically work in browser, um, kind of like a Google Doc where you know, multiple people could be on the same doc. Like now you could do that in something like Figma. Um, which is pretty cool. There's also a lot of really cool features, something called auto layout. Um, you could inspect uh, uh, inspect code. Um, so basically when developers go into the Figma, uh, the Figma document, they could actually see the CSS and, and that sort of thing so that they know how to build it um, for them. Um, and another one is Adobe XD, which is the one that I probably use the most. Um, I use it at my, uh, my current job and uh, it's probably my favorite just because I use it so much. And, um, you know, it's an Adobe product. Uh, Adobe products have existed for, you know, decades now. Um, so you know you're getting quality. Uh, Adobe just had Adobe Max, which is basically a uh, three-day event uh, where a lot of people do talks and things like that. So they released a lot of really, really cool new features, which is pretty great. Um, and then the third tool, it's not like a true prototype tool, but I think that it is worth mentioning, um, especially for like the UX design community. Um, it's called Webflow. And it's basically sort of like halfway in between something like a Squarespace, which is a very easy, uh, you know, drag and drop tool. Um, but then also it's kind of like, you know, if you know how HTML and CSS works, um, then you could basically kind of like create prototypes and create uh, actual web pages too with Webflow. So uh, those are the three that I would definitely like, love to highlight. Okay, cool. That sounds great. So John, let's have you share your screen with us so we can dive into those tools that you mentioned. Yeah, sure. Um, so basically, uh, if you see my screen here, um, this is basically what Figma looks like. Um, I'm actually going to go to the top right corner here to this new file button. And it basically is going to give me this blank screen here. Um, but what I could do is I could uh, click over here on the top here where it says frame. And this allows me to create some sort of screen and frame and uh, create some sort of prototype. Um, so for example, if I wanted to create a prototype for a mobile application, um, I can click on something like iPhone uh, 11 Pro over here. And it's basically going to give me this frame that resembles an iPhone uh, oh, cool. screen here. We talked about how complicated something like Photoshop would be. Um, well, if you look at Figma, there's really only, what is this, uh, seven buttons here, which is basically all you can do. Um, but then with, the, with these seven different things that you could do, you could kind of like, you know, make really amazing things. Um, so basically what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna take some text here and I'm just gonna say something like press me and let's zoom in so it's a little bit bigger. You know, this is basically going to become a button. Figma does have a really cool function um, which is called auto layout. So basically the way that I do that is hold down shift and press A. And now this basically gives a little bit of a uh, background to this uh, press me thing. So what I can do is turn this into a button um, by coming here and changing the fill color. Let's make it a nice blue color. And I'll change the text color as well. Change this fill to white. And, you know, if, if we were to create a simple kind of prototype, I think the, the best thing to do is just to have me press a button and then show you what happens when I do the press that button. Um, so all I'm going to do is click on the top here where uh, the title of the frame is. And I'm just gonna do a, a quick copy paste to create a second thing. And in the second screen, instead of saying press me, I'm just gonna say something like, okay, it's been pressed. Something like something stupid like that. And I'll even change the background color to, let's say, green. Um, now, the way that a prototype works is that it's a simple, uh, it's a simple sort of interaction from one screen to another. Um, so what I wanted to do is show you what would happen if I were to press this blue button. What I wanted to do is to go from the blue screen to the green screen, basically. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, highlight on the blue button here and I'm going to come to the right side to where it says prototype and basically once I press this prototype you'll see that uh, from this blue box you'll see that now there's a, uh, a little circle to the right of it. So I'm going to take that little circle and I'm going to drag it to the next frame and you'll see it's, it actually is automatic the way that it hooks to it. 
Um, and that's basically it. Like that, just doing that, um, it enables a prototype. And I could even change how it works. Um, if I want to make it like dissolve or move in and out, I don't know, we could do dissolve and see what it looks like. And that's basically it. Um, so now if I wanted to see this, I could just press this plus button up here and it's going to open up a new window. Um, and now all I have to do is just press this button and we'll see what happens. And you can see that it basically just goes from the blue button to the green button. So it's pretty cool. Very simple, but um, if you would have just imagined that this is this would be like a complicated prototype with a lot of buttons and a lot of graphics and things like that. It would look a lot more interesting, I think. And John, what are some of the pros and cons of using Figma? Well, uh, one pro that you'll notice is that um, I'm actually not in any sort of program right now. I'm basically just in the browser. Um, I'm just using Firefox right now. And that's something that's really cool because I don't have to save um, a lot of documents onto my computer. It doesn't have to get, you know, really hectic. Uh, I think when people were using Sketch back in the day, and even now, um, a lot of times what would happen was uh, designers would have to save their Sketch files and then email it or, you know, airdrop it to their teammates and things like that. And that kind of, uh, you know, causes a little bit of, of a problem when things are, when changes are made to a, pro to a project. And also another, another pro is that, uh, as I mentioned before, you could actually inspect code. So I could actually see the, the CSS here on the right side. One of the cons about uh, Figma would be that there really isn't like a true version control. Um, I'm sure that they're, they'll definitely work on that eventually, but um, a version control being that if there are multiple people working on this project at one time, um, what happens if, you know, someone makes a lot of different things that like you don't actually want for uh, the project. Um, there isn't a true way to kind of like go back in time and fix that sort of thing. And then another thing is basically that, uh, you know, this, because this is on the browser, um, you can't, uh, I mean, you can kind of like open up a project and then go offline. Um, but basically, if you don't have internet, uh, you can't open this up from the start. There is a desktop tool that you can use. Um, but uh, from what I know, I, I think that the desktop tool doesn't doesn't run as smoothly. I could be wrong about that. But I've actually never run the desktop tool myself. But that's what I've heard. Oh, this is this is wonderful. Um, let's move on into Adobe XD to see what that looks like. All right. So I'm going to, uh, I'll just leave this window here. And Adobe XT is I basically made this little thing for you. It's a, a fake a fake furniture store. Um, and Adobe XT, you can see that it is um, it kind of looks a little bit like Figma, where you know there is that left side with all the different layers and and artboards and things like that, uh, which Figma calls frames. And on the right side, you have basically all of the different changes that you can make. So for example, if I were to click on this thing here, um, you'll see that, you know, that fill, that border, like I could change colors just like that, do a similar sort of thing to Figma. Um, so it kind of makes you think that if you know one tool, it is kind of easy to, to be adjusted to another one, which is kind of a really cool thing. Um, a lot of times people would ask me, you know, how many do I have to learn? And my answer is always the same. It's basically just get really good at one. And then if you get a job that asks you to do, to do another one, then just, you know, take a day to, to learn the new one. But it's not really too much of a learning curve once you know that first one. But uh, one thing that uh, Adobe XD has, which is pretty cool, is this thing called uh, the repeat grid. And basically the way that works is, um, if you'll notice on the top here, I did make a little bit of a nav bar. Um, but let's say that I didn't, want to do the nav bar like this, you'll see that on the uh, left side here, I basically have shop online, I have uh, about, and I have uh, contact here. Um, let's say I just want to get rid of all three of these things. So I'm basically just going to get rid of the three of them and delete. Um, I could use this thing called the repeat grid instead. Um, and basically what that means is that I could take one functionality and just extend it as many times as I want. Um, so now I could just take the home button and just extend it to as many nav bar items that, that, that I choose. Um, so basically, I, just, I could just do these four here, maybe extend the, the, uh, the spacing in between them. And, you know, if I wanted to change what it says, I could, you know, make something like shop or, you know, about or contact. And it's very easy, very easy to use. And John, similarly to Figma, like what are the pros and cons of using um, Adobe XD? Uh, one of the best things that I, I love about Adobe XD is is this uh, um, the repeat grid that I just uh, that I just showed. Also, they have a lot of UI kits that you could also use. So if you want to have the style of let's say like an iPhone or something like that, um, or you know Microsoft or something like that, you could actually download those and basically just use them in your prototype. And just to be clear too, so Adobe XD you have to like download as a program onto your computer. It doesn't. It's not like Figma where you can use it in a browser. Yeah. So Adobe XD it is it is a program that you. Um, the good thing about Adobe XD is it's a lot more lightweight than a lot of the other Adobe products. 
Um, so, you know, something like Illustrator or Photoshop, it's very heavy um, and it's, it's just, it, it's hard to use on a, on a small computer. Um, but XD is, is pretty much a, a very simple program that could be, you know, very quickly used. Cool. Let's move on to Webflow because I would love to see that now compared to Adobe XD and Figma. All right. So Webflow um, is also a product that you use uh, within the browser. Um, so Webflow, this is Webflow here. And basically I'm making a new project. And what's good about Webflow is they do give you, um, you know, you can use the blank canvas as you see here, but then you can also use different types of templates that, uh, you know, allows you to kind of create a web page from here. The whole point of Webflow is, is for, you know, creating a website. It could be a website for the desktop, but it could also be something responsive, which also lives on a tablet or something mobile. Um, so let's just say I wanted to use this, uh, this portfolio starter here, um, and I'll just call it John's Top Notch Project like the, the random names that they give these things. And this is what it looks like. Um, so you'll see that like it is very different from the first two tools that we did see, but it is a really good way for a designer to basically um, work for themselves, um, which is very powerful. Um, if you're a designer that is freelance, for example, um, you could use this tool to basically do designs, do prototypes and things like that, and then also create websites for your clients which is pretty awesome. And the way that it works, it's pretty similar in that I can click into here and I could basically just make adjustments there. Um, so instead of saying, hey there, I could just say, hey, you'll notice that on the left side of the screen is basically all of the different things that we're working with um, from an HTML standpoint. For example, everything here is listed inside of the body. Um, then there is a navigation tab and then a section where my text is. And then on the right side, um, this is how I make adjustments um, to the CSS and things like that. So for example, um, if I wanted to make more space on the left margin, I could basically just drag this and you'll see that it is pushing it to the left side there. And you know, there's a lot of different things that you do. You could change the typography from here um, and the color and things like that. So you know, it, it, it does look a little bit more complex than the first two. And I definitely think that if you are looking to just make a very quick, simple prototype, um, this probably isn't the first thing that you should look at. I think that this is more for when you know exactly what you're you're planning to make. Um, but Webflow is a super powerful tool. And um, in terms of creating websites, it basically turns a designer into um, like a, a one-man design team and development team. That's so cool. So especially with using Webflow, should someone know like just basic programming like HTML, CSS to like fully utilize everything on um, Webflow? Yeah, I think that that probably is the best way. I think that with Figma and uh, Adobe XD and a lot of those programs, you probably could get by never knowing anything of HTML or CSS, although it would be a good extra skill to have. But with Webflow, you know, I, I think that if you do know just basic HTML and CSS, you don't really need to know JavaScript or anything like that. Just by knowing those two basic things, you'll have a leg up. Um, and what's good is if you don't, you could even just try to learn it by using this. Everything is visual. And when you actually make changes, as you saw when I was making the change, it is real time. And you basically see what things do. Um, this wasn't the case when I was learning HTML and CSS. Um, so I think that if I had this when I was learning those two markup languages, it would be a lot easier. So thank you so much, John, for walking us through those three tools. Um, I'd love to dive in with a few more questions. So the important part about prototypes is that it's being created in the moment with a team. So it's not the final, final product yet. So I'd love to know what can designers learn from failed prototypes? Um, well, I mean, you learn more than you learn more from when you fail than when you succeed. Um, cause it gets your brain thinking like, what did I do wrong? What can I do better next time? Um, I think that, you know, a failed prototype is, is basically just, it's a chance to improve and, um, prototypes also happen early enough in the design process that um, you know, you can make changes to failed prototypes before production even happens. Um, one of the main reasons why you do prototyping is that if there is anything wrong with it, you can make those changes before it's too late, basically. So Thinkful is offering a really engaging and free webinar series around UX UI with you as the instructor, John. Um, so I'd love to know, how do these webinars help those who are just getting into the design field? Uh, the webinars are basically intended to be a stepping stone for a person who is pretty much under the impression that UX may be too hard for him or her. Um, you know, it's, it's a 90-minute chunk 
of time. Um, and in those 90 minutes, it's my job to basically show that person, you know, Hey, guess what? Like, this isn't too difficult. Um, you know, you basically just need some confidence to kind of like, you know, get started and, and that sort of thing with that sort of confidence, you could be motivated to learn, you know, either through the thankful program or even try to learn on your own if you wanted to. Um, I think that's, you know, all of the, uh, all of the, the, the tools that you need are online or in a book or something like that. But it, I, I think that there are way too many of these uh, kinds of like tips and things like that. So it's hard to kind of like filter through, well, what do I learn first? Like what is, you know, there's all these different types of tools, like which one is the one that I should learn? Um, so I think that's with the webinars, it kind of gives you a chance to talk to someone who is involved with the UX community and the design community. And, you know, I'm able to kind of like filter questions, answer questions, and give you tips on how to kind of like approach it from where you are, whether it be beginner or intermediate or expert. And John, you have an untraditional path into UX design um, with your background in web development and journalism. Um, so I'd love to know, like for those who are thinking right now of making a career change, what do you think are the qualities someone needs to have in order to get into the UX UI fields? Oh man, there's, there's a lot. Um, I think the main thing is is basically just to be open minded. You know, know that you're not going to be good at first. Uh, you know that it takes practice and and that sort of thing. Um, but where UX is just really just a, a great field to be a part of is that it accepts all different types of backgrounds. Um, like me, for example, like um, you know my journalism backgrounds. It gives me experience when I interview stakeholders, for example. And, you know, with my coding background, it gives me um, an easier time talking to developers. Um, that's one of the main reasons why I have my job today is that um, I did have that coding experience. And I do, you know, spend my mornings talking to the development team, even though I never touch code. Um, so I think that's, you know, there are... Um, a lot of uh, repeat disciplines that I do see over and over. Um, people that study things like psychology or um, even like hospitality, um, things like that are, are things that, you know, you, you basically are trying to be empathetic towards people and you're trying to solve problems. Um, so if you are able to, you know, leverage your past skills to do these things and solve these problems, then you're going to be great at UX. And you know, the UX field has only continued to expand um, every single year that, that we continue on in technology. So I'd love to know, like, as we look towards 2021, are there any tools or methodologies that designers of, of 2021 should have in their skills toolbox? Um, I, I've, I've seen a lot of things about 2021. What's going to take off is stuff like voice UI, um, dark mode, things like that. Um, but basically, you know, when something new happens, when something new comes out, I think that, you know, the early adopters of the design community that try it out at first, you know, those are the people that, that kind of like, you know, uh, have a lot of success and stuff like that. So when new, new technologies come out, when new things come out, I think it's cool to kind of try them out and see if it's something that, that is going to stick, basically. And that's an excellent place to wrap up this intro to prototyping. Um, thank you so much for talking with me today, John. We will be posting a recording and a transcript of this video interview on the Course Report blog with contact information for Thankful, just in case you are interested in applying for one of their upcoming cohorts or checking out these amazing webinars. Um, and thanks so much to all of you for watching. Tweet at us, email us, let us know which topic you'd like to see us cover on the next Course Report blog. And in the meantime, follow Course Report on Facebook and Twitter. And if you're a bootcamp alumni, don't forget to post a review of your own bootcamp experience on Course Report. Your review is a huge help to anyone thinking of getting into tech today. Mm -hmm.